let's let's move let's get started Hey, so um, you just to, to be to be clear, I just want to make a couple quick announcements. Um, wait, hang on one second. Okay, so uh, just a couple of really quick things. A, we did a, a rescore on the on the quiz. So whatever your score was, so for, not everybody, some people don't get the benefit of the rescore, but may, probably about three quarters of you did. Uh, so because some of the questions were, were, were not good, or some of the answers weren't good. And um, secondly, the World in Conversation is looking for some interns. So um, this is a position that can turn into a paid position. So if you, if you are if you're interested, um, see me after class or talk to, to Nish right after class. So um, we're, calling, we're calling this class Heartbreak and Hope. And uh, it's a really, it's a very, it's kind of a, it's a little bit of a difficult class for me. So I wanna, I wanna start out. Because there's nothing that I can say in this particular class that would be accepted by everybody. We're gonna talk about the police and we're gonna talk about violence and racism and uh, unequal treatment and fairness. And, uh, and there's nothing that I can say uh, that would be accepted by everybody. So I, I've worked uh, with the police. Um, I know many, many police. I know the inside of policing and I have a perspective that, that come I have ideas that come from that perspective. Um, I also uh, work with and colleagues with people who are very much part of a movement to radically restructure policing that have, a, a very, have very strong opinions about the police that are not always positive. And, uh, and so what I wanna tell you is, you know, from this side, you know, this for me, and, I, and I'm saying this because I want you, to, as we're walking into this, we're walking all of us in a certain sense in a in very like, tender and difficult territory. But uh, for me, um, the, you know, if I, if I, the people who are here, the people in the camp that are more supportive of the police are going to criticize a lot of what we say today. And the people who are in this camp of criticizing the police are going to critique a lot of what is said today because I'm, we're not going to take sides and we're just going to talk about some things and I think in a really uh, thoughtful and, and interesting way. So the class, before we get to you all, right? So can you go to the, the first slide? So, so th this class, it's inspired um, by Terry Nichols. And if you don't know the story, this is a, a young man uh, from... Uh, Memphis, Tennessee, who was pulled over by uh, the police, by some police, and uh, for allegedly some kind of minor traffic infraction, but th that has never been clear that there even was an infraction, but who knows, maybe he swerved his car a little bit um, somehow. Um, but essentially he was murdered. And I think we can say that the officers that, that killed him are being charged with second degree murder. And I think if you watch the tape, this was a couple weeks ago, but I know a lot of you don't pay attention to the news, so you know something happened, but you don't know what it was. Um, if you watch the, the video, there's a lot of video of this. He was, they killed him, they murdered him. They lost, they lost their minds and they, they absolutely murdered him. And uh, I think that that just kind of, it, when you, when you watch the tape, you, you really see this, okay? There, you can cut it and slice it up in lots of different ways, but these, and, they, and, you know, the, the, and by the way, just if you go back, just look at him. It's just, they, by all accounts, he's a really nice guy. He was a, skate, he was a skater, right? a skateboarder. So they, by all accounts, a really nice guy, really sweet dude. Um, okay, so go to the next slide. 
Um, and these are the, the five officers who killed him. And, uh, and so this, this is, it's, it's heartbreaking in, in so many, so many, many different ways. This is really just heartbreaking to see anybody who, who loses their lives. Uh, it's heartbreaking. The, you know, I'm a sociologist, so I also know that human beings um, can, can lose themselves in a moment and behave in ways that they would not ordinarily behave. And you, we have to grant that to all people. I grant it to each one of you. I grant it to myself. There are times when I've done certain things that are completely out of character for me. And, and even though I take responsibility for those things, and I have to still, it's heartbreaking that I acted so out of character in this way that makes no sense. And so that's also part of the heartbreak, is that, you know, is all of the pieces of this. It's just terrible. Okay, so we're going to talk about it. And uh, before, can, can we, before we do that, why don't we just do, why don't we just do the, the quiz really fast before I introduce you to our volunteers. And, um, and if you are, watching the stream while we do the quiz, just I, I want to reemphasize that this is, uh, I'm, I'm going into this class with the recognition that um, many different constituencies will be watching, including people who are very uh, pro-police and people who are very anti-police. And, and I am walking, I have prepared it, prepared the questions, our volunteers, and we're walking forward with that idea in mind. Um, that somehow we have to, the only way to get to the truth is to look at things on all sides. Bro, we're doing, yo, we're doing attendance, man, so get your canvas out. Are we good? I mean, remember, if you ever can't get on, take a selfie with that in the background and then send it to Julie right during class, okay? Uh, can we introduce you all? We'll st yeah, go ahead. Do you, yep. do you want me to start? Yep, why okay. don't you start? Hi, my name's Rachel. I am a junior rehab and human services major. And how, why did I choose you? My dad was a cop for 20, well, police officer for 20 years, and he's currently security at an elementary school. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Reese. I'm a political science and criminology major, um, and my dad is a state trooper, my brother is a state trooper, and I have two cousins that are officers in PG County in Maryland. Mm -hmm. Hello. My name is Abigail Turner. I'm a sophomore accounting major. Mm -hmm. And you have an uncle who's a police I have an officer. uncle that's a correction officer. Correction officer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so let, let's, let's go with, can you go to the next right here? So let me, let me start with this. This is a, from a Gallup poll. I didn't put Gallup at the bottom, but it's a Gallup poll. And they ask people, um, you know, diff, they ask people based on their part, political party identification how much confidence they have in the police. And the statement was, I have a great deal of confidence in the police. And you can look at these differences, right? People who, who identify as Republicans, 67% are saying, yes, I have a great deal of confidence. Independents are 41 and Democrats are 28. And for me, this is actually very troubling, I will say, to the three of you. Because um, the fact that we could all be living in the same world and based on some political party affiliation that I'm not really sure what the party has to do with support of the police, but that we could have these vast differences in the, in, in the way people respond. And it tells me something about how incredibly divided we are and, and how, how really un, unsettling that is, right? Because we're divided in these ways that really just make no sense. Um, okay. So, can you go to the next slide? All right, so I'm going to ask the three of you, right? 
Um, so who do the police represent? Who wants to start? Who do they represent? I would say the communities that they're protecting, everybody in the community. Everybody in the community. So, ev okay, can you say more when you say everybody? What do you? Just anybody from anywhere. It doesn't matter who you are, what gender, what race, whatever you are. You're always supposed to be protected by the people mm -hmm. protecting, well, by the police protecting you. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to protect you. And, okay, Reese or Abby, would, w so who, there would be some people that would qualify that answer, I think. Or would, would you add anything to it? Would you qualify it? Would you? I mean, ideally, the police are there to protect and serve everybody, but I feel like everybody doesn't feel like the police are there to protect and serve them. Mm hmm And, and how, what do you think about their, f Abby, would you agree with that? I would agree with that statement. And when, he, when Reese says, everybody doesn't feel like the police are there to protect and serve them, are there, can you say something about are their feelings legitimate? Like, you know what I mean? Like, to what degree are their feel thoughts or feelings legitimate? Anybody want to take that? I feel like everyone's thoughts and feelings, like regardless of your experience, whether you have good or bad experiences, uh -huh. they're always valid. Mm, they're not always valid, well, actually. I mean, like, well, they no, should because, be taken listen, into consideration. No, no listen, though. No, let, let me be really clear here. Let, let me start right here. If I say, hey, y'all, um, I know, uh, like, fraternities, did you hear about that fraternity down on whatever, what they did last weekend and what happened at that fraternity? You know what? Like, frat guys, they just, they suck, man. Frat guys are just assholes, right? Like, because you just saw what happened, and, like, and it happened a year ago, and it's like, or two, two weeks ago, and frat guys are assholes. Like, you would call me, you call me out on that, right? Like, you'd say, like, ah, oh, dude, come on, man. You can't say oh, you, all frat guys are assholes, right? But we do this thing with police whereby, you know, we, we read one thing or we see one thing or we have our own personal experience, and then, like, all cops are assholes. And, like, and so that might be your feelings, but that doesn't mean they're legitimate. Because, like, come on, man, you can't say that. I can't say that about frat guys. I can't say it about white people. I can't say it about whoever, tele, televangelists. Televangelists are all thieves. It's like, well, you can't say that, but we do it with police. And so I want to make sure that that's on the table here. So do you want to add? I think that's just, like, something that it's a problem with trying to make a broad statement about a group of people because everybody has individual experiences and yep. individual thoughts and feelings, and you can't really just categorize one group based off the experiences you've had with one member of that group. But when can you do that? When can you make broad generalizations, right? Under what conditions? Can you, maybe, maybe not can you do it, but when can you like walk into the territory? There's a big imaginary circle up here of broad generalizations about the police. And we can't, you, know, you can't really go into it, but, but at what point can I walk into that circle and say, you know what, but I'm gonna make a couple broad generalizations about the police. I mean, I think if there's, like, overwhelming evidence to, like, support something, that's definitely somewhere where you can make a generalized statement. Okay. okay. I also okay. think, like, when there's a problem, like, I feel like you can make, like, a generalized statement because, like, you need to solve the problem. I don't know. Yeah, maybe, okay, maybe solve the problem. Or you gotta, maybe you have to have done the research to look at things on multiple sides, right? So, like, when you offered your very first answer to that very first question, like, I, I knew, I know you, you were giving the most general sense. Like, they, they, police are, they serve everybody, right? But Reese put that one key word in there that changed everything that you left out, which I don't think you would leave out, but ideally, when you put ideally in there, it's like, okay, now we're in a different territory. So, um, okay, so the police represent. Let me just make a couple comments about representation in the police, okay? So I'm just going to now speak to the class. Can you go to the, to the next slide? So I don't think that, um, here's the concentration of wealth in the United States. And, you know, the, the richest 10%. So, so if you all were the U.S., you, this is the nation that is the United States, we could take the 10% of you that are the wealthiest. Let's say it's this group right down here on the bottom. I mean, you're just the wealthiest of everybody in this room. You are the, the ones who have the most wealth, or the families, 10% of families, right? That's what we're talking about. 
you would control 75, 76% of all of the wealth that is controlled by this entire room, by the entire nation, right? 76%, 10% of the people. The middle 40% controls another 22%, which would mean the poorest 50% of the people in this room. You only control, so 50% of the families in the U.S., only control 1% of the wealth. Now, think about how unequal that system is. And think about how, in order to maintain that, like how would it be for you all if that's how it worked in here? And how much money you had determined how, what kind of grade you got in Social 19? And how you were treated in Social 19? And think about, in order for that to sustain itself, and for those of you who are in the bottom 50%, or in the, even in the bottom 25%, even more so, you, man, you got to hold, you, we got to have some control here, because you got to, to have this much inequality, you got to be able to control the people who have less power. We'll enter an entire legal system, an entire criminal justice system, which is put into place on top of gross inequalities like this. So let me think about the police. The job of the police is to protect, ideally, to protect everybody. And it, and it really is. It's not just ideally, right? If you're poor and your neighbor steals your lawnmower, you, you know, you're poor and you live outside of State College in a trailer and, a, and maybe a double wide and, you know, like, ah, you're really poor, but your neighbor steals your lawnmower, you call the police. The police are going to come and they're going to... You say, like, there's my lawnmower over there. They're going to get your lawnmower back and they're going to arrest the person, right? I mean, it doesn't matter if you're poor or you're rich. You're going to have some kind of response. If you're rich, you have, you're going to have the benefit of maybe a more response in some way, right? Like you have better lawyers, better this, better that. Maybe the police are more responsive in certain situations, but nonetheless, right? So they're there. But at the same time, what kind of criminal justice system do we have that is built on top of this kind of inequality? So you gotta ask yourself that question. Wait, who are the police? Who are the courts? Who are the judges? The prisons, the jails? Aren't, don't you think they're probably set up that they probably benefit the people on the top more than, they treat people on the top differently than people on the bottom? That, that doesn't, you don't, that's a no-brainer to me. That might sound like a real left, neo-Marxist, radical idea, but it's really not very radical. It's just kind of a given. That's like saying, you know, we're all breathing oxygen right now. This is a given. Okay? All right, so go to the next slide. So when I see cops like this, I'm like, yeah, yeah. If I'm part of the elite in this country, and it's some, I'm part of the elite in the world, for sure. I, yeah, these guys, they're, they're, they're probably more likely to be protecting the haves than the have-nots in most situations, right? They're going to protect the poor. They're going to protect black people. They're going to protect brown people. They're going to protect people in poor communities also. But man, I look at that inequality. I'm like, you got to hold that in place with force at some level. So it's like, okay. And then I go to the, and then I, oh wait, leave it right there actually. And then I think, okay, as a sociologist, so this is me, and then we're going to come back to you all in a second, right? I'm going to get into this. I, I just walk into the circle of generalization now, okay? Tr you, you have to trust me that I'm not, that well, you can decide whether you trust me or not, but I'm not speaking as a radical here. I'm just speaking as a, as a thoughtful person who's really looked at this and who's trying to be fair to as much as I can be fair to. Pretty much wherever we look, we see black people, and to a lesser degree, and Native Americans, and to a lesser degree, brown people, Hispanics, and so on, as experiencing more detrimental treatment at the hands of the entire legal system, okay? We just see it. The question isn't, do they, right? The question isn't, is Abigail more likely to get, or, or you know, is Reese and Rachel more likely to get preferential treatment in some way than Abigail? If, I, if I'm going to roll the dice, I'm going to be like, yeah, they, they probably are. 
in many situations they are, but how much? It might just be a tiny bit, and sometimes it might be a lot. So, like, on average, we see it. So I'm going to just show you a couple things. I mean, I, I, you know, it's a th- this is something I've been studying for years and years and years, so I'm not going, I'm not saying there's racism everywhere, and my God, it's horrible, and black people are treated so negatively in every situation and so on. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is every time we shine a light in the treatment of people who are black in the entire criminal justice system, we see that something's not right. Sometimes it's like, whoa, whoa, damn, that, it, that's, whoa, oh, that's so terrible. And sometimes it's just like, yeah, that's really kind of not cool. That's not cool. Okay, are we good? So I'm going to show you a couple of things. Leah, go ahead and show. This is annual marijuana use by race. Um, This is the Uniform Crime Reporting. I I try to get the best data that I can on this, Census Bureau Crime Reporting. Um, Black Americans, on average, use slight marijuana. This is, you know, in the past 12 months. um, This is all black people, by the way. If we look at black people just 18 to 25, which is most people in here, white people use more marijuana. And marijuana shouldn't even be illegal, but I'm going to use it nonetheless, right? Um, So... But it's not that much. Like, you, you look, it's like, you know, okay, so instead of, it's like two percentage points. It's really not that much, okay? All right, cool. But now look at the next one. Arrest rate per 100,000 people. Look at black people compared to white people. This is arrest rate per 100,000 people. So it doesn't matter that there are many more white people. It's not about that. This is per 100,000 white people, per 100,000 black people. And those are some serious differences. And how is it that that happens? Right? And, I, and I could turn our attention in lots of different places. Do you have a, do you have a, yeah. So go to the next slide. This is the likelihood, the lifetime risk of being killed by the police per 100,000 people. So it's African-American, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Latino. I wouldn't use Latinx, but I, I just copied this. So total white people, Asian Pacific Islanders. Look at, look at the difference. So it's, a, it's almost 100 for people who are African-American compared to white people, which is less than 50. Lifetime risk. Okay, now that doesn't... But what's that mean? That's just a lifetime risk, right? Black people, African-American people, might be more likely to commit kinds of, to to engage in behavior where they're more likely to be killed by the police. There are any any number of things that could could be happening. So we don't know. But nonetheless, where we turn, and we're gonna come back to this in this class, but when we turn our attention, we say like, yeah, it's not fair. And the system's slanted against black folks in different ways. How much? I don't know. I'm being, I'm just being, trying to be fair. Sometimes a lot, sometimes not so much. Okay, go to the next slide. So when I see this person here who's protesting uh, a couple summers ago against the mur- the killing, mur- we can say murder, really. Uh, it's a little different, but nonetheless, of George Floyd. Uh, I understand, I get, I understand this guy. Why is he going to get that megaphone and stand in front of all those cops and just be saying sp- just yelling at him. I get that. Because I look at this stuff, and I'm like, yeah, I'd, be, I'd be pissed. I am pissed for all of my fellow countrymen and women who don't look like me, who are not treated like me. So I feel pissed. It's not fair. Okay, so I get it. Okay, next slide. All right, so... Uh, good cops, bad cops. So who wants to take it? Who, what makes a good cop? What makes a bad cop? Define that, you all. Who, who, hang on, not, let's not go with Reese. Abby, go ahead. You, let's start with you. What's a good cop and a bad cop? Because this is what we're talking about. Oh, there are good cops and there are bad cops. And like, help us understand how you see it, not, not, not how it is out in the world. This is just how, how Abigail sees it. Um. Well, I'm just going to preface this first. Like, I know a lot of people, some people would say that, like, no cops are good or, like, anything like that, which I don't agree with in a sense. I think that a good cop is somebody that doesn't 
use their biases, like to use the stereotypes towards people and like always gives people the benefit of the doubt and is truly like doing this for the community and not doing it um, just for like money. But like obviously it's a job. And then a bad cop is just somebody that uses stereotypes and like uses their power and like overuses it. Mm-hmm. Use, uses their power, abuses their yeah, power. Abuses their power. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Rachel, how about you? I was just going to say a bad cop abuses the power that they have. They're very authoritative sometimes. But a good cop would be someone who's a cop for the right reasons. Like they want to help their community and they just want to help people. Mm-hmm. And like Abigail Can said, not having like using their biases against uh-huh. people. So could the people who really are there to want to help people, can they sometimes just be really authoritarian? Like sometimes they, sometimes that happens. Like sometimes that's a good thing for them to do that. I feel like sometimes, like depending on the situation they might. Mm-hmm. But I feel like sometimes everybody has good or bad days no matter what job they mm-hmm. have to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like me in here sometimes. Sometimes I got to just... Like, it's a, it's, a, it's a crowd, you know? This is a crowd of people, and sometimes they just got to yell at you. And for example, like, to close your computers. Like, closing your computers, for example, right? Putting your phones away. Like, I, sometimes I just got to do that. But I do it kindly there, but sometimes I, if somebody doesn't respond... And then I'm going to then I'm going to yell. I'm going to raise my voice. And then if they don't respond, I'm going to raise my voice a little more. And then at some point, I'm going to be a dick. And you're going to be like, "Oh, why do you have to be a dick?" I'm like, "Well, did you not watch what was happening here? You know what I mean? Like, why why wouldn't I be? Anyway, good cop and a bad cop. What do you like? I think like what's the so again? Just keep going. Like, what's the difference? And try to see where you. I mean, for the most part, good cops are there for. They have good motivations behind what they're trying to do. I mean, they have a job and they have to do it, but they're not going to go above and beyond to abuse their power. And I think that there's certainly people that I know that I would say are bad cops or just necessarily aren't the right type of person to be a cop Mm -hmm. um, that do take that. So you know personally people who you're like, who are cops, and and you're just like, nah, man, nah. I know there's definitely people I can think of off the top of my head that not necessarily are a bad cop, but they aren't the right type of person to be a cop, so they shouldn't be given that level of power over other people. Mm-hmm, 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 got you. Okay, so you feel like here are some people with certain personality characteristics that you're like, nah, man. Do you want to add to that? Do you have, do you have would you, what, what would your dad say? He must have talked about this. I mean, he's told me about some coworkers that were assholes, but there are people who should definitely not be a cop. And I also think, too, like, there's some people who go into it thinking it's going to be so great and wonderful or, like, they might get too scared sometimes. So Mm -hmm. being a bad cop can even just be, oh, my gosh, Don, I'm in this. I'm terrified and I don't want to go on calls and, you know, just anxious, too. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I will say that I, uh, my experience of policing is, is very much that. You know, my experience of police officers is that they know, like, who, who, to the people they want to work with and the people they don't want to work with. And you don't want to work with the person, for example, who, like, raises the stakes. I was on a call with, a, I was doing a ride-along with, uh, with the police one time, and we roll up to this one call. And the cop I'm with, I'm sitting in the front seat next to him. We pull up to the call, and he's like, ah, shit. And I said, what? And he said, um, wait, we good? And he said, uh, oh, you know, uh, so-and-so's here. Let's just say Mark. Mark's here. And I'm like, what, what, yeah, what's the problem? He's like, I know what this call is. I know what it's going to be. I know this person. We get a call from them about once every couple months. I know exactly what's coming down. And Mark's going to ensure that it's much more likely that it goes south. And then we're going to end up arresting somebody because he's a dick, right? And we're going to end up arresting someone, and you and I are going to be going back to the station with someone in the back seat in handcuffs. And, like, it doesn't have to be that way. But this guy makes it more likely that it is, right? And so I'm like, yeah, okay. Well, that's pretty common, right? So anybody is going to have that. 
Um, let, let me show you something. Can you go to, the, go to the next slide? So one thing to think about here, there are about 90, 950,000. Depends on how you cut it. So somewhere between, or I say it's 900,000 to 1 million sworn law enforcement officers in the United States. So I say 950. And that's a lot of people. So when you want to say, for example, like all cops are bad or all whatever, it's like you're talking about 950,000 people. Come on, man. Like all fraternity guys are assholes. There's a lot of fraternity men here. They're not all assholes. You know what I mean? All Arabs, all Muslims, all Christians, all Jews, all black people, all white people, all college professors which that's the current new thing that I guess people are liking to attack. It's like 950,000. So I have three, these are the three types of cops. This is me, I'm generalizing. I'm walking in the generalization circle again, okay? Social workers with guns. By the way, I say the same thing about people in the military. Uh, they wanna protect people, right? Did your dad, why, why was he, which one is your dad? My dad started out as, I need a job. So he came out of the army and said, well, his dad was chief of police. And he's like, I already know some of the things that go on. So might as well just do this. So he started with, as a worker. Yeah, started as a worker. But I feel like once he got into it, then he became the social worker with guns. and wanted More to of help. a social worker. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bro, how about you? Uh, I'd say he was probably like a social worker with a gun. I mean... He knew he always wanted to be a police officer. He actually started as a municipal cop in state college. And then... Is, wait, is this your dad? Yeah, my dad. Yeah, and your brothers? Uh, my brother started as... Uh, he was an agent with the FBI, actually. And then once he got accepted to the State Police Academy, that was what uh -huh. he transitioned to. And Abigail, what do you th what's your gut? Like, what, what are most cops are which category? What's your gut? I would say two. What's that? Two. Two? Workers. Number two? Workers, just a job? You know, I, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I think it's from my experience talking to people, talking with cops and my experience working with cops, I actually think it's a, it's a cross between one and two. And I think it leans more toward one. Um, I think so. But again, that depends on lots and lots of things, but somehow, and even the bullies, so many people who become bullies, they start out as bullies because they feel, number one, so strong. Man, they want to protect. Like people, that, you know, you join the military because if you're paying attention to what's going on around the world and you, and you want to do something about it and help people, man, so many people are joining the military because they want to go off to these places. Do you, do you want to add anything, anything? Did I say anything that, any of you, that you would, you know, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's a, a question from the stream, by the way. We're going to, mm, can we come back to that? The question is, 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 it, is, it, is, it, is, it, uh, is it possible for cops, like bad cops, like good cops and bad cops, okay? Bad cops are the ones that, we, I, we never really defined it. I think you did a pretty good job sociologically. It's like, we didn't define it legally, but a, a good cop is one that really tries to stick to the rules and tries to understand their biases. I'm going to change from what the three of you said. For me, it's, you never know what your biases are, right? I don't know my biases, but I work really hard to understand what they are and try to not allow them to infect or be part of my teaching so that I can teach through them. And a good cop would be a cop that really tries to do that. You try to do the right thing, knowing that you will not always do the right thing. And when you do the wrong thing, you, you really try to learn from it. That's to me, is a good cop. And a bad cop is an ignorant, kind of narrow-minded, not interested in growing and learning and just doing the job and going home and not really caring about their own lives, better, betterment of themselves and need betterment of the community. And a really bad cop is the one that breaks the rules. And a really, really bad cop is the cop that, that supports other police officers breaking the rules. That's the worst kind of cop, okay? So the question that came from the stream is, is it possible that, well, people could be a bad cop in one place and get fired and go someone else and get hired, go somewhere else and get hired? Yeah, it is, but it's increasingly difficult for that to happen, as we've seen just recently with a few places. Okay, so here. 
Um, hang on, let me look at this. Um, so, did we decide, did I ask you how many, which, did I ask the two of you which one you think is the most common? I mean, I think it's the workers are the most common. You said, did you already say that? No, but, yeah. You think workers? Yeah. I think it's definitely, a lot of them have good intentions, but a lot of them do just do it because it's a job. Do you, they end up doing it because it's a job. Yeah, and the, and the problem, of course, with this, that it's just a job, and this is what police say, it's like, look, you have a sp if you're a cop, and this goes to your, your family members and, you know, to your corrections officer, but it's the same thing. It doesn't really matter, right? Yeah. What's that? And Rikers, oh, yeah, the Rikers, okay, hang on, yeah, that's like being a cop. In a, you have a special obligation because you're, you're, you're given a gun, you're given authority, and you, it's your job to apply the laws of the land, and you, you know that you can, there's so much flexibility in which you can apply or not apply the laws of the land. That you have, you, you have a special obligation to say, I got to really try to be as fair as I possibly can on this. And that's the problem with, with police, right? That you really are, you're held to a higher standard. And in fact, you should be held to a higher standard because that's the nature of policing. But the rest of us, of course, then have to understand where our role comes in. And, and that's where I think we've sort of gotten off tilt. Okay, so go ahead. Next slide. Um, when police make mistakes, right? Question for you. Um, how often do cops make mistakes? Anybody? How often are they making mistakes? Whoever wants to take it. Abigail, you want to take it? I would say often are people, but... I feel like their mistakes can their mistakes can um, affect a lot of people and affect people in a uh, greater way. So I think their mistakes have to be um, be very careful. Uh huh. Okay. Brave. Okay. So they can make mistakes often, but the problem is when when they make some mistake, they can really impact somebody. It may be just sending someone to jail for shoplifting, for you know trying to put food on the table. And like, you don't see that and you don't want to see that. And you're just like, come on, man, come on. It could be that. And somebody could say, well, that's not a mistake. It's against the law. And somebody else would say, come on. So it could be something like that, or it could be what happened with Tyree Nichols. How about the two of you? Like, how often do police make mistakes? I think there's like little mistakes throughout their day that they might make, even when it comes to like pulling someone over, do I pull this person over or not? And they might not pull them over or they maybe should have. Or there's little mistakes with putting someone's name in or like charting something down. But the big mistakes are a the lot terrible more serious. Ones. Yeah, the big terrible mistakes are more serious and detrimental. How, and how often are police officers making really serious, terrible mistakes? I gotta think a second. You don't, you don't have to answer that, actually, because that's a question that none of us know. It's hard. Like, it's hard to... Yeah. Yeah, yeah you don't, and you don't have an answer to that. The truth is, right? I mean, you're going to try to answer it here, but I love how your instinct was to not answer that, because you don't know. None of, I don't know. Nobody knows. I, we could put a hundred cops up here and ask them that question, and they don't know. When, when I, you know, when I'm working with the police, I, I have sources, I have data that I'll run past police, basic data about policing and arrests and so on, and they don't know the data. And I'm like, how do you, and I remember with this one group of cops, I'm like, how do you not know this? You're police officers. How do you not know this basic bit of information that actually would be beneficial for you to know? But they're like, yeah, I don't know, we just don't know it, right? I'm like, okay, well, nobody knows in some ways. It makes it like a big, grievous, egregious mistake. Bro, let me just ask you, how often do cops do really terrible and unethical things? Because if I, if, I, if I ask people, and I'm going to ask you, and the reason I'm going to say, I'm going to cut you off here, right? Because if I went around the room and I asked everybody, like in the middle of this murder, 
of Tyree Nichols. How often are cops making egregious and grievous and terrible mistakes, unethical mistakes? Most people are, most people are, are going to have an answer to that. Someone's, you're going to have an answer. And the question is like, where'd you come up with your answer? How do you get that? Like pull it out of here? Like where'd you get the answer from? Like people have so many opinions about things they don't know anything about. I mean, how do people who have opinions about the police know all about the police, but they've never actually talked to the police? They never really sat down. They never really spent time. The only time they talk to police is when the police, they're being confronted by police for something. But that's not the police. There's 950,000 sworn police officers in this country. It's like, come on. Like, what do you know? Do you go, well, it's in my neighborhood. Well, that's your neighborhood. It's not my neighborhood. And then I say, well, in my neighborhood, the police are really friendly and thoughtful and they don't. They don't abuse their power. Well, that's because it's your, it's my neighborhood. But I go to a different neighborhood and it's going to be a very different story. And so what I see in my neighborhood, I can't extrapolate to the rest of the country. In like this unit where these five police officers were, it's the Scorpion unit. Man, they were like, they turned these guys loose. They basically, you know, the, the, the city... In the, in the upper echelons of the police department, they basically turned them loose. They said, just go out and be like scorpions and just attack. It's like, come on, man. Look what that, that, that's, like, that's pretty egregious. Okay, so anyway, did, did, you, did, I, did you answer the question? Okay, now answer the question. Um, I think that, I mean, mistakes obviously are made, and when they are so egregious that they garner like national attention and we see it in the media, that's definitely something that it happens, but I think when you take into account the, put it in perspective of how often people are interacting with the police and how many of those situations could go wrong and don't go wrong that people don't necessarily get to see, it makes it not necessarily better, but it puts a little bit more in perspective. Okay, so can you say something about how often people are interacting with the police? Or can any of you say that? What do you mean by that? Just like, day-to-day -day interactions that people do have the, with the police, it's such a high number, and the number compared to that number of things that go wrong and when people do make mistakes, that's really the piece that we see. No one gets to see the day-to-day -day okay. interactions, really. Okay, do you have any idea what that number is? Do you have any idea with how many police contacts there are? Do you have a guess? No matter what you guess, you won't even we be close. We said like 65 million. Okay, 65 right? million, right? So oh, yeah, I did say that the, before class. Yeah, okay. so maybe like... Go to the next slide. 10 million? No, no, no. So 65 million in police encounters, right? Yeah. And 10 million arrests. Right. That's a lot of encounters, y'all, right? That's a, so when you think about what makes the, front, the, front, the headlines of the news, right? And we think when things go really bad, it makes the headlines. And you think there's 65 million police encounters in the United States. It's contacts. It's called contacts in the world. The FBI calculates it as contacts. 10, 10 million arrests. That's a lot of contacts. That's a lot of arrests. And so when I want to make a statement about police, right, policing, and I want to say, oh, how often it goes bad, how often police are acting like in, in bad ways and good ways. Well, I have to look at it in terms of these numbers. It's like, damn. Like for me, for example, here's a good example. Every year, I have 4,500 minutes in which I teach this class. Every year, okay? There's 30 weeks, 4,500 minutes in which I teach this class. And I think... Out of 4,500 4, minutes, I think I'm pretty reasonable and thoughtful and I'm, you know, mostly say things that it, maybe the, if they're not really super smart, at the very least, it's like, it's okay, fairly thoughtful, right? But once in a while, I say something really, really dumb. And if you capture that moment of being really dumb, and let's say it's like one minute out of 4,500, it's like... Okay, but go to the 4,500 for a second. Like, hold on to that. Like, let's really look at this, okay? All right, so let me, I'm going to walk you through some data. Um, let 
By the way, there are certain neighborhoods where people are much more likely to have police encounters. Let's go back to what I said about race and racism and unequal treatment. There's a disproportionate number of these contacts and encounters that are had by black people and brown people. Okay. And the encounters that go bad are disproportionately experienced by black people and brown people. That's a given. The question is how much more? Disproportionate doesn't mean two times or three times or five times as much down here. It just means it's disproportionate. So now what does that mean? And in some neighborhoods, it's really disproportionate in some communities where the police are really going after black people and brown people. In other neighborhoods, less so. But there aren't many neighborhoods where it's a mix of people where police are much more likely to go after white people. And if you can imagine a story in which, if we go to Tyree Nichols, where a middle class or upper middle class white guy, any of you, most, which would be most of you in here, would be 300 feet from your home, get pulled over by the police, the police just giving you from the get-go contradictory statements and yelling at you and get out of your car, don't get out of your car, put your hands on the steering wheel, let me see your hands, like put your hands down, like one thing after another, and screaming at you and swearing at you. And you're sitting in the car trying to go, trying to decide, first off, I don't even know that these are police, so they could be anybody here to rob me or take, or, or take my car, anything. The cops are just being just complete badass assholes. And, like, and so, and then eventually, you know, he's like, what did I do? And they rip him out of the car and they put him on the ground. And if you can imagine how often that happens to upper middle class white kids in an upper middle class white neighborhood, 300 feet from your home, and all the cops are black. Has that ever happened? Has that ever happened? in the United States, where a bunch of black cops pulled an upper middle class white kid out of his car in an upper middle class neighborhood, the neighborhood in which he lives. Has it ever happened? Would it ever happen? And I'm like, I don't know. I doubt it. And then it makes me wonder, okay, well, what happened with him is extreme in that he was killed. But how often does that kind of actions on the part of police occur with black people? And what I wanna to say to white people is, you have no idea. If you're not studying this, you have no idea because you cannot base this on your own experience. Just like I can't base policing in the United States based on how policing happens in my neighborhood a mile from campus, okay? Do you see that? Like, so this is a complex thing. All right, let me go to the next slide. Since January 1st, 2015, how many people have been killed by, by the police in the United States? What's your guess? Like 7,000 maybe? 8,000? I have no idea. I generally have no idea. You have no idea. You didn't even give a guess. Guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would guess that most of you. Do you have a number, everybody? you have a number in your head? And when I say killed by the police, what do I mean? What do I mean killed by the police? I assume like police brutality. Like they're... Like, police brutality. They're like murdered by the police. Murdered by the police. Or do you mean like... No, no, hang on. Them? I'm not... Just what do you... What do you what, where's your mind go? My mind goes to police brutality. Okay. I would say the same thing. Same thing? Just based off of stuff I've learned in like criminology, but that stat I'm assuming is relating to just any death in an interaction with the police. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. So here, go to the next slide. So, so, the, so that's the number, okay? Been killed by the police. So now let's look at what that means. 
First off, what's it mean that it's 8,000? 8, 8, Let me ask you, Abigail, what's 8,100? Is that a lot? Is it not a lot? Like, what's that number mean for you? That is a lot. It feels me. like a lot? Yeah. There's 330 million Americans, like 950,000 sworn police officers, 65 million contacts every year, 10, 10 million arrests. 8,166 people are killed by the police. I still feel like that's a lot. Okay. All right. Well, let me go through the numbers and then let's see what, what that means. Go, go to the next slide. Okay. What percentage of these, of people killed by the police are white? 30%? 30? Um, yeah, I'd say 30% as well. Something like 30? Do you, what's that? Oh, you know that? Okay. What, what do you, what do you, what's your? I mean, just by the numbers, it is mostly white people, I believe. Uh-huh, by the numbers, mostly white people. Here, let me, let me, sh let me show you this, right? Go to the next slide. So the 60.1% is the percentage of people who identify as white in the United States. 51% are the number of the 8,000. 8, and now, mind you, look, see the unknown number at the bottom for those of you who are math people? I'm not including in the percentages here. I'm not including this number. Okay? Cool, the unknowns. Um, but for black people, 12.6% of the population and 27% of the population of people who are killed by the police. And, okay. Uh, other would be people of Asian ancestry, Native American ancestry, and so on. And the unknown is because, so these data, by the way, they come from the Washington Post. So a number of years ago, there were a group of writers at the Washington Post decided, researchers decided, we're going to try to figure out exactly how many people are killed by the police. Okay, we're going to do our best. We're going to figure it out. We're going to go through all the data banks we can possibly go through. And we're going to really do our best to figure out what this number is. So this was after, um, yeah, this was in, in around 1996, or pardon me, 2016, okay? And the problem is the unknown, is, is there are some folks for which we don't know, and the, mostly it's, it's more recent cases, because it takes a while, because not every police department is obligated, police agency is obligated to submit these data, and not every police agency collects these data. But as best that we can know, um, what I would tell you is, having parsed through the numbers and having really read about how these investigative reporters are finding these numbers, I would say that the unknowns aren't unknowns because police are hiding them because they're black and brown people and they're hiding them. The unknowns may be a little bit disproportionate. They're going to mostly mirror these percentages right here, okay? Probably. If I had to guess... As a, thought, as a sociologist who's trying to be fair, the unknowns are probably going to reflect here. They're not all going to be, let's say, people who are black because the police are trying to hide the fact that they're killing so many black people. Okay? I don't know that, but it's my sense of what I know of the data. Okay. So let me ask you this question before we go to the next slide. Um, go, go to the next slide, actually. So how many were... So here's a question for everybody. How many were unarmed? So Abigail said, when I said, what's it mean when I see people who are killed by the police? What she said, oh, what you're talking about are people who were murdered by the police. They were killed by the police through some, I don't know, what did you say? Is that what you said? I don't know. Is that police brutality? Police brutality. So they, somehow the police acted wrongly and they killed people. Okay? Brutality. So that's what, so that's where your mind goes. Okay? So now, yeah. That's where my mind goes, but I know that some people are probably armed and like going against the police and they, okay. sometimes they have to take force, but yeah, that's where my mind goes. Okay. Okay. Got it. All right. I think that's where most people's mind goes. If I, to, if when I asked that question, how many are killed by the police? My guess is that's where most minds went. Okay. So how many, no, go back. How many were unarmed? Oh, you saw it? Do you know? Do you, have a, do you have a sense? I don't know. Yeah? All right, go to the next slide. 
you know, we have a lot of guns in this country. And policing is because we have so many guns, like 400 million guns owned by citizens. 400 million guns, y'all. That's a lot of guns. Like, we're, we are a gun-loving people, man. I, you know, it's whatever. We have a lot of guns. They're out there. And of the 8,166 people killed, like, look, and blunt objects, by the way, are, you know, hammers, bats, clubs, I mean, there are any number of things that people can use. Other could be hatchets, swords, spears, crossbows, any number of things that people bring out. And replica guns, because replica guns are replica guns. A police officer, if you pull a replica gun on a police officer, they don't know if it's a real gun or not a gun. Okay, vehicles, undetermined or unknown. So some of the undetermined or unknowns are unarmed. And some of these doesn't mean that the person pulled the weapon on the cop. The police killed that person and they had a weapon on them. They had a knife or they had a gun or they had something. So it doesn't mean just because 463 people are unarmed, it doesn't mean the police didn't act in a way that they shouldn't have act, acted, in my opinion. It's like you didn't have to shoot. You know, I've been in conversations with lots of cops. Like, why why'd the cop have to shoot that person? You really didn't need to do that. Well, the person had a knife. I'm like, well, get inside your damn cop car and lock the doors. You know what I mean? Like, just get in the car and lock the doors. Like, you don't have to shoot him. Like, they're, they're having a mental break. So just, get, just relax for a second, man. You don't have to go that far, but it's police procedures. And in police procedures, we are a land that has created a very strong policing with strong procedures that if you get out of hand, we've given the authority to police to take lives. For whatever reason, this is the way we've decided that we're going to do policing. It's starting to change. And like when I talk to police, it makes sense. Every time I walk through a case of somebody getting shot by the police or taken down by the police and they walk me through what happens step by step by step, in the end, I always go, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I see that. doesn't mean I agree with it, but I see it. So it doesn't mean the 463 people are just like standing around, like Tyree Nichols who's just, the police just kill them. There's something happening, but still they're unarmed. And still when we think about being killed by the police and police brutality and police murder, 8,166, it's not 8,166 because some of these folks, a very large number of them actually, are acting in ways that are definitely dangerous to other people or dangerous to the police. So like, okay. So now here we are, right? Here we are in this place where we can look at the police and we say, oh, well, here, let's, can we go, let me go, go to the next slide. Of the unarmed people, 148 were black. Now, if it was fair, and distributed equally, right? Meaning if black people, unarmed black people were killed as often as unarmed white people and Hispanic people and Asian people, the numbers would be what they are in the red. 278 of the 463 would be white. 60 of the 463 would be black. And 88 would be Hispanic. So it's the Hispanics, it's, kind of, it's what it is. So right there you say like, huh, what is it that black people who are unarmed are more likely to be killed by? Like, what's going on? But is it, does it, is it, but are, are, the question I have is, are these numbers enough when, for people to make these blanket, generalizable statements about all police? Like, what are, what are we looking at here? Like, like it's a problem. It's a problem. I'm not, I'm not defending the police. 
I'm thinking it through. Like right now, I'm thinking through out loud. And I'm thinking through as a white man who's at this stage in my life, it is highly unlikely that I'm going to have any confrontation with the police at all unless I start it. Whereas I look around the room at all these young people, all of you, and I see white people, black people, brown people, and I think, yeah. It's not completely fair. But when I look, and when I look at the numbers, it's like, well, how unfair is it? So if we think only in terms of activism, it seems like, whoa, it's so skewed. And if we think about it in terms of trying to really get to the answers, maybe we come to some different thoughts about it. You know? All right, man, let me go with, let me show you. Can you go to the next one? The, 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 the title of the class is Heartbreak and Hope, and Hope, was it? Heartbreak and Hope, is that what it was? Yeah, well, here's the hope. We, are, we have really started to reform, like, peop, be, mostly because of black people, by the way. So, white people, um, see, look, look here. 197 million white Americans in 2015, 31 pe unarmed people were killed, white people were killed by the police. In 2022, nine people. In 2021, it was less, I mean, it's just been going down. And white people, let me just say something to you for a second. Fewer unarmed white people were killed by the police because of black people. Because black people took to the streets. And black people said, there's racism going on. We're going out in the streets. We're going to protest this. And they went after police and policing. And the police and policing had to respond. And they have responded. And some of the demands are pretty extreme and some don't make a lot of sense. But others are saying, no, this is a racist, corrupt institution and we need to look at it. And some people maybe are, their assessment is entirely racist and entirely corrupt is like, okay, hang on a second. But black people took to the streets. It's like, okay, so look at the numbers. This is the hope. This is activism, right? Like, you know what I mean? This is activism. So you're, you're you know, all of you who are involved in policing, anybody out here, you be better cops across the board. Commit less egregious just actions against the citizens. You trying to you're supposed to protect because people took to the streets it's like okay next slide um so a thankless job uh can you just go go just go to the next one i was going to ask somebody i want to make sure um and police are attacked you know felonious deaths i mean felonious deaths are deaths in which somebody actively tried to kill and kill the police officer so like that, that would be, you know, like your father, your father, you know, your uncle, right? Like these, these are, come on, all, all these people have families. So it's, it's also, you got to see police as, at some level protecting, they're also protecting themselves, which is, I, which is not, doesn't give them a right to attack people, but there is something here in this society we've made where it just, we just keep ratcheting up the violence. It's like, come on, people. One final thing. Um, next slide. There was a student, a student group who, mostly students, I think, who protested at the municipal building in front of the cops. That's the cops right back there, uh, the police department. It's like, um, fuck you, state college police. Uh, most of these people are not black, by the way. They're mostly white people. Abolish the police. ACAB, you know what ACAB stands for? You guys know, right? You know? Do you not know? Is it all cops are bastards? All cops are bastards. It's like, does, is that really, really, really? 950,000 police officers, all cops are bastards? It's like, come on, man. Like, can we, like, all frat boys are bastards. All Penn Staters are assholes. 
because you're at Penn State, and you know the Sandusky scandal. Why'd you come here? You shouldn't be here. You're, so you're all like supporting child pedophilia, and you're all assholes. You shouldn't be here. Penn State should have been closed down. So you're all assholes. All cops are bastards. That's how it works. Right? And then no police on campus. Like, okay. All right, man. So to me, that's a little bit. Um, anyway, listen, man. What do you, what, what do you, final thoughts. Where was I not fair? Where did I lean too far? Because you could, you could argue that I, I, I didn't, I, I'm not portraying policing in a fair way. You could argue that I'm not critiquing police in a fair way, like in a way that they really need to be policed. You could go back and forth. Do you have any, any final thoughts? What do you think your dad would say about today, when he watches today's class? I think he'd like that you touched on everything, every little aspect, every little thought. Do you think he would agree that when I was a part of where I'm talking about, you know, it's, a, it's an institution all law enforcement is slanted against black and brown people at some level, to some degree. To some degree, yeah. Uh -huh. And by the way, you know, your dad, he worked in McKeesport, right? Where those two police, the police officer was just killed yeah. two days ago, right? Yeah, that's been a big thing going on right now. Yeah, I mean, just, just worrying about <clears throat> his past cop buddies and yeah, friends and dude. things like that. He, he was saying, like, I came home every day. Yeah which is hard to think about. You know, for me, I'm gonna leave us, on, I'm gonna leave us with one thought, right? Uh, no, I'm not, go ahead, bro. Final thought, and Just then we're gonna do the quiz. At the end of the day, they are still people. I mean, they're doing their job, but they are still someone's dad, someone's brother, someone's something, and the ones that you do see in the media that are doing things that are terrible, that doesn't represent the majority and nor does the majority support them in any way. I mean, you're gonna f have a hard time finding any police officer that supports anyone who does something like this that are the names of the people on those posters. Yeah, so there, there is a way in which there's a, we go, hang on, hang on, hang on. I wanna, I wanna say this and I want you to hear it. There is a way in which police, like any organization, any group of people, will circle the wagons to protect themselves, right? So police will be like, yeah, I gotta protect this other person over here just because even though they did wrong, you know, we still gotta, I still gotta support them and protect them, okay? We do that when we make these strong teams and when we do this kind of stuff, right? Um, it's getting hard, it's getting more difficult to do and we're now part of the changes that are starting to take place. It's like, for example, municipalities are passing laws, laws that say like, if you see a, a police officer, anybody doing something that is illegal, then you have to step up. And if you don't step up, then you will be, uh, you're threatened with arrest, prosecution and arrest. And that includes, if you see a police officer using a chokehold on somebody and you're another police officer, it's not, you have to step in and do something because we're gonna arrest you. And so we've now started to take these kinds of actions. We're gonna, we're gonna pass laws to ensure that you do the right thing. And this is part of the changes that we're starting to see. And there's probably a problem with that, but nonetheless, this is important. Final thought, and then we'll do the quiz. Um, I think it's more of like the system than the actual people in it. Um, I know like where I'm from, like I used to like see police like every single day when I like go to school, like the commute to school and like in certain areas I saw police more and then other areas yeah. I didn't see them as much. So I think it's just up to the system to be educating the police officers on certain things. For and sure. Also like under, like as much as like their people they have family also the people on the street in the community people have, and citizens have family, have family at the end of the home. day every citizen has a yeah. home they want to go home to another thing too is like people just automatically assume but the, the police officers are bad so when i would say oh my dad's a police officer i'd get oh yeah exactly dad's a police officer so i'd get ashamed to say it too but no. just because my dad's a police officer doesn't mean that 
I'm a crappy person. No, 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 dude. It doesn't like mean your dad too. is. Dude, we want police officers. Like, I want to be able to get on my phone and call the police when something, when I need the police. It's like, come on, man. Like, so I've had a many, I had a police in tears one time at, at this idea, a cop. Just like how terrible it is, the, the hate that he experiences from people. All right. Hey, can we have a round of applause, by the way? All right, man.